morning, I, uh, we prepared the Lord's table. I'm messing with my papers here. We prepared the Lord's table, uh, communion. And our communion, I always say this, we have some new faces here this morning for the first time. Our communion is an open communion. You don't have to be a member of our church to partake with us at the end of the service. All you need to do is to be saved, born again and saved. And that's the most important thing. Uh, a few years ago, <clears throat> I, I did a message. It was a communion message. And uh, I don't remember how long ago it was, but I, re I do remember I had a beard <laughs> at that time. So I don't know how long it's been since I had a beard. But I did a message called, Until He Comes. Because when Paul uh, wrote his letter to the church of Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, as often as you do this, speaking of communion, as often as you do this, you do show forth the Lord's death until he come. And we often think when we say communion, we think do this in remembrance of me. We remember what he did. But we need to understand not only are we remembering what he did, but we're looking forward to what he's coming to do. Jesus is coming back. How many people know Jesus is coming back? If you don't know it, I hope you're going to know it before this service is over. Jesus is coming back. We don't know when. But we sense, I sense, that it's near. I know one thing, it's nearer than it was yesterday. And uh, I'm not a date setter. I I've, I've, I've was looking, and you know, we've heard, um, those of us who have been around long enough, have heard people try to set dates for the, they say, the end of the world. Listen, I want to tell you something. The world isn't going to end. And somebody says, well, it's the end of the world. It's not going to be the end. Of, when Jesus comes back, he's not going to destroy the world. He's going to establish his kingdom for a thousand years. Then after a thousand years, the new heaven and the new earth will come. The old heaven and earth will be burnt, will dissolve like fire, and there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and that will be our eternal home if we're believers in Jesus Christ. So when somebody says it's the end of the world, you can dismiss that right off the bat. If somebody tries to tell you they know when Jesus is coming back, you can pretty much write them off too. There's been, uh, over the last couple thousand years, there have been literally hundreds, and probably more than that, but hundreds <laughs> notable, of people who've tried to set dates. And uh, just, just a couple, you know, I'm just going to read this because we're going to get into God's Word. Uh, in uh, 500 A.D., uh, there was a, 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 they called him an anti-pope. I don't know the difference between a pope and an anti-pope. Uh, and uh, they, they said that uh, Armageddon was going to be that year. Well, that, we know that didn't happen. And in uh, January 1st, the year 1000, Y1K. How many people remember Y2K? Okay, well, they had a Y1K too. And uh, it says that many Christians in Europe had predicted the end of the world on this date because it ended in all zeros. It was a nice round number, you know. Uh, uh, that the world would end on this date. As the date approached, Christian armies waged war against some of the pagan countries in northern Europe. Their motivation was to convert them to Christianity before the end of the world, by force if necessary. To force them, you know, hold a sword to their head and say, get saved, or, or else. Um, it says, meanwhile, some Christians had given their possessions to the church in anticipation of the end. I can't figure that out. If the world was going to end, why would you... You would figure the church wasn't going to be there, but I don't know. But, but they, gave, they gave them to the church. Uh, it says, uh, fortunately, uh, the level of education was so low at that time that many citizens, they didn't even know what year it was. Uh, they did not know enough to be afraid. Otherwise, the panic might have been worse than it was. Unfortunately, when Jesus did not appear, the church did not return the gifts. <laughs> okay. You just imagine that. I remember back in Y2K, how many people remember that? And everybody was selling them books about everything, all the horrible stuff that was going to happen in Y2K. Well, you know, when it didn't happen, nobody offered their money back, right? I mean, I said, you know, I would say, give me my money back. You were wrong, but it didn't happen. Okay, just a few other things. Uh, 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 1284, Pope Innocent III computed this date by adding 666 years unto the date that Islam was founded. Uh, they were doing, dealing with Islam back then, too. Uh, in... Uh, Here's, here's a good one. In 1669, the old believers in Russia believed that the end of the world would occur in, in this year. 20,000 of them burned themselves to death uh, to protect themselves from the Antichrist. That's pretty drastic stuff right there, isn't it? Okay. Uh, 1794, here's a surprising one. Charles Wesley, Charles Wesley of all people, one of the founders of Methodism, thought that doomsday would occur in this year. And, of course, it didn't. Uh, 
A few other ones in 1844, of course, uh, uh, the Great Disappointment. William Miller predicted the, uh, the end of the world and uh, October 22nd, 1844. It didn't happen. Uh, 1914, 1915, 1918, 1920, 1925, 1941, 1975, the Jehovah's Witnesses predicted the end of the world. They missed that a few times, uh, didn't they? Uh, they're the ones that knock on your door and want to give you the watchtower and uh, you say, well, well, you know, how come we're still here? You said it was going to end. Back in 1988, a fellow wrote a book that said 88 reasons why the rapture will happen in 1988. Didn't happen. Uh, then he predicted 89 and 90, 91 and 92, and I think he passed away after that. And he quit predicting. And finally, of course, the one that we're most recently uh, familiar with, with uh, Mr. Harold Camping, who owns radio stations, predicted it would happen May of this year, and it didn't happen. Then he said October of this year, and it didn't happen. We're still here. It lets me know that we, you know, if somebody comes off and they say they know when the end of the world is going to be, don't listen to them. People were selling stuff and quitting their jobs and cashing their life savings to go out and spread this good news that the world was going to end this year and it didn't happen. Now what are they going to do? They, all they had to do was listen to what Jesus had to say. He said, nobody knows. The thing is, we don't know when he's coming back, but we know he's coming back. And, and we get a sense that it's going to be soon or near and there's some reasons for that. You know, back in the year 1000, they thought he was coming back because it was 1000. And all through these last couple of centuries or uh, millennia, they said, oh, Jesus is coming back. And they all could have justified themselves trying to figure out who the Antichrist is going to be. You know, uh, Napoleon, Reagan, whatever, fill in the blank. Everybody had their idea who the Antichrist was going to be. But the thing is, today, there are certain reasons, there, there, there are definite reasons why we feel like we're close to the end of the age. Okay. Now, I'm not, again, I'm not trying to set dates or say it's going to happen in my lifetime. I don't know. I have no clue. But I do know this much. Number one, there's a nation of Israel. We know, and we're going to read here in a little bit, that before Christ can return, there has to be a nation of Israel. There has to be a temple. There hasn't been a temple since 70 A.D., almost 2,000 years. So before Christ can return, there, now there's no temple. The temple isn't built yet, but Israel is back in the land. Back in 1948... They were granted a, they, a nation, and back in 1967, they recaptured Jerusalem. So that's a prerequisite for the return of Jesus Christ, that Israel be there and that there be a temple. The temple will, will be built. Another uh, thing that's going on, of course, we all hear wars and rumors of wars, and we've talked about that, things going on all over the world. And one thing that really, really captures me is being su such, a, such a, a, a harbinger of what's to come is the economic situation in the world. Now... Think about this, you know, in Jesus' day, you know, the nations were uh, pretty much, I mean, if, if you lived in Israel, you didn't know what was going on in North America. You didn't even know there was a North America, let alone that there was anything going on there. But today, we have a global economy. There has to be, for the things to happen that the Bible predicts, there has to be a global economy. And there is today. Uh, a cashless, you know, how many of us use debit cards? How many of us wish they never had invented debit cards? <laughs> okay, oh, I, the first, when they first came out with debit cards, that was before I was married, I used to get in all kinds of trouble using my, using my bank card, all right, because I didn't keep good records. Anyway, uh, so we have, we have, we have we, uh, uh, electronic transfer of funds. You can buy something and never take a dollar bill out of your pocket because it's all electronic. We have in, in uh, what used to be called the European Common Market, is now called the European Union. They have a common currency called the Euro, and, and they're going bankrupt. You know, if, if Greece goes bankrupt, it's going to start a, you know, domino effect. It's going to affect the whole world. And do you know, and I've, I've read this, and I believe this is true, I've, I've seen this from very credible sources, that they're, they're trying to, to have an Amero. They have a Euro for Europe. Well, they want for, like, Canada and the United States and Mexico to all have a common currency. There might come a time in our lifetime when we no longer have, you know, George Washington and, and Abraham Lincoln on the bills, but we'll have instead Ameros that are, that's good for, you know, a global economy. This is coming. So we see things happening in the world that's, that's making the world look like the Bible says it's going to look before Jesus comes back. So this morning... Uh, like I said, a couple years ago, I preached a message called uh, Until He Comes. This is going to be part two, okay? And I want you to turn with me, if you will, over to uh, 2 Thessalonians and uh, chapter 2. Now, for those Bible scholars out there, you know that 
1 Thessalonians, these two letters, the, the, the Apostle Paul wrote the Thessalonian letters to the city called Thessalonica, which is still there, by the way. It's, it's in northern Greece. Uh, there's still a city there. And uh, when Paul traveled into Europe, the first place he went was Philippi. You can read this in the book of Acts. And from Philippi, he went to the city called Thessalonica. And he started a church there. And when he uh, left there and he went south, he went to Athens, the church in Thessalonica began to experience great persecution from mostly from the Jews uh, that were trying to stir up the Romans against them. And they were, they were experiencing a lot of persecution. And they, they had questions for Paul. They wrote letters to Paul asking him questions like, what's going on here? You know, is Jesus coming back? Is this the end of the world? What's, what's happening here? Uh, and when, when they had, certain of their members had passed away, so they wrote Paul, and they said, did they miss Jesus? Did they miss heaven? What happened? That's where Paul wrote the letter in 1 Thessalonians, in chapter 4, he said, I will not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. And he told, told them and taught them about the rapture of the church. He said, the time is coming when the trump of God will sound, and the dead in Christ, those who have died in Christ, their bodies will rise from the dead. And he prepared them. He said, that time is coming. In chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, he, he says, uh, you, you know, when they're, when they're saying peace and safety, then will come sudden destruction. He was preparing them for uh, what was coming, and he's preparing us. Well, these were written not just for them, but for us too, that we could, we could understand the way things are going to happen. And in 2 Thessalonians, uh, chapter 1, I'm just going to read through chapter 1 very quickly just to set up chapter 2. It says, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy under the church of Thessalonica in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith grows exceedingly, and the charity, or the love, of every one of you all toward each other abounds, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Paul was saying, I know what you've been going through. You've been being persecuted, you've been being gone through tribulation, and you're still working together, you're still loving one another, your faith is growing. How many people know faith grows in tribulation? The church, in times of great persecution and tribulation, the church will grow like weeds. I mean, when the, the, the early church in the first couple hundred years of the church spread all over the place, and they were feeding them to the lions. So they weren't like attracting them by telling them, you know, you'll be rich and you sow your seed and you'll get a lot of money back. They were, they were preaching the gospel. People were repenting, coming to Christ, and some of them were giving their lives for their faith. Paul says in verse 5, which is a manifest token, your, your persecutions and tribulations that you're enduring, they're a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you suffer. Paul was saying, listen, if you're being persecuted, don't be ashamed, but wear that as a badge, as a token. That's a, that's a proof that you're doing something right. When the world hates you, Jesus said, if the world hates you, don't be surprised because it hated me, it's going to hate you. And a matter of fact, if the world falls in love with you, you ought to check your relationship with God. <laughs> because if we're, if we're doing the things that God wants us to do, if we're, if, we're, if we're trying to be righteous, if, if, we're, if we're depending on the blood of Jesus Christ for our salvation and for our holiness and sanctification and all these things, then the world's going to reject us. Your old friends don't, aren't going to want to hang out with you anymore. They're not going to want to hear that Jesus stuff anymore. If, if you're being persecuted, Jesus said, if they're uh, talking evil about you, do a dance. Rejoice. Because they're doing that to you now. Listen, God's judgment is coming. That's what Paul says. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Oh boy. <laughs> we don't have to get even because God's going to take care of that. If they don't get saved, they're going to be judged. And it's going to be at God's hands. Pray for them to get saved. Jesus said pray for those that despitefully use you. That's a hard thing to do. But he said to do it. Well, let's do it and let's leave their future in God's hands. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, the next time you feel like life isn't fair, you can tell yourself, that's right, life isn't fair, but God is fair. And when he comes back, he's going to make it right. He's going to take vengeance. 
You can turn over to Revelation chapter 19, see when Jesus comes back, it's with a sword coming out of his mouth and flames coming out of his eyes. and He's coming back in judgment to a lost and a world that has rejected his, his, his word, a, a world that has rejected his love. He says, they shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Pretty heavy stuff to those that don't believe. I'll tell you what, if I was an unbeliever and I was hearing this, this kind of stuff, I would think very, very seriously about where I want to spend my eternity. When he shall come to be glorified, in verse 10, in his saints, and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness with the work of faith with power. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I read that to set up chapter 2, but here's the thing. All the suffering that they were doing, the suffering that we might be doing, the suffering that Christians are doing in the world today, it's all for the glory of God. That God could show his power, and God could show his might, and God could show his love, and God could show who he is in their lives, in our lives. Okay? Now, chapter 2. Here's what I want to get to. Paul says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. He's coming, and he's coming to take us. He's coming, and he's coming to take us. Aren't you? Listen, we ought to rejoice. We could stop there and have a party at that. He's coming, and he's coming to take us out of here. Hallelujah. I beseech you, verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is, is at hand. Paul's saying, listen, don't believe. You know, there were people going to the church of Thessalonica and saying, you guys missed it. Jesus had been here and back already. He's gone. Those people who died, they missed the Lord. You missed the day of the Lord. You missed Christ. Where were you? Paul says, don't believe him. Don't believe them. When somebody comes and tries to tell you that it's all done with it, you know, there are folks that try to say, oh, we're living in the millennium now. No, we're not. This isn't it. If this is it, my goodness. Sold me a bill of good. <laughs> if this is it. Paul says, don't believe them. Some, somebody had actually written a letter and signed Paul's name to it. He said, don't believe them. He says, some things got to happen before the day of the Lord. There are some things that have to happen before Christ returns. Okay? Listen to what he says. See, I'm, I'm saying this this morning so you can be equipped so as we share the Lord's Supper, as we look back to what he's done and look forward to what he's going to do, we can have an understanding. People need to have an understanding of what God has planned. So when we give a message like this, every once in a while we'll give a prophetic type message like this, it's so that you can be armed. When somebody comes and tells you, you know, the world's going to come to an end and such and such, or that Jesus already came back, or, you know, he's coming back and he's investigating the lives of... You can, you can say, no, wait a minute. Listen what happens. Listen what Paul says. Let no man deceive you by any means, okay? For that day shall not come, except, number one, there come a falling away first. Falling away. It's a Greek word, and it's a word we would translate apostasy. A falling away. It means a diverting from, a leaving the faith. Now somebody will say, over the last 2,000 years, people have left the faith. There has been a fall. What was established by the apostles and Christ? I mean, God has kept his word pure over 2,000 years, but there have been a whole lot of people that have tried to turn it upside down and inside out and try to make it say all kinds of things that it doesn't say. Somebody say, well, depart from the faith. It's been going on for 2,000 years. But listen to what Paul is saying. What do you think is going to happen when this thing we call the rapture happens? 
Now the rapture, and for those of you who don't understand, again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, is when Christ comes in the sky. He doesn't, he sets his feet on the ground, okay? He comes in the air, and a trump of God sounds, and the first thing that happens is all the dead believers come out of the grave. Amen. For the last however many years we've been around. And right after that, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, members of the body of Christ, you know what's going to happen to us? He's going to catch us up. That's what the word rapture means, to be caught up. Amen. Now, he's not going to catch up everybody that's a member of the church of God. He's not going to catch up everybody that's a member of the assemblies or a member of the Episcopal or a member of this or that. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a church title that marks us as being, you know, headed for the rapture. It's Christ living in us. How many people know there's a whole lot of folks that sit up in churches that don't have Christ living in them? There's folks that stand behind pulpits and preach that don't have Christ living in them. Believe it or not. Not here. <laughs> not here. There's, there's people in, in positions of leadership in churches that don't have Christ living in them. So when the rapture happens, I hope this place is empty. <laughs> but there's a good chance there's going to be a few left around. <laughs> I hope you ain't one of them. <laughs> if you are, it's your own fault. But there's going to be churches, I mean evangelical, fundamental, charismatic, Pentecostal, spirit, tongue-talking churches, that, that there's going to be people who are going to be left around looking and say, what happened? Why? Because not everybody that sits in church is saved. Not everybody that cracks a Bible open and stands in front of a pulpit and preaches is saved. We're not saved by the church we belong to. Or we're not saved by our vocation or by our calling. We're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And sadly, not everybody has appropriated that salvation. We want to try to save ourselves. We want to try to be religious. We want to try to wear amulets around our neck. We want to try to pray to statues and pray to uh, medals and, and all this. We want to try to do all this kind of stuff to think that we're going to please God and make God happy when we realize we can't do a darn thing to make Him happy except put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's the only way He can accept us. And there's a whole bunch of folks sitting up in churches. More and more, I'm sad to say. They just say, I'm a Christian. I'm, yeah, I'm a Christian. I go to church. I got the t-shirt that said Jesus loves me. I got well, when I'm sitting in the bar having a beer, I tell my buddies about Jesus. <laughs> Hard rockers, rappers, man. And they say, I thank my Lord. When they get the award, and you know, I thank my Lord Jesus. And they curse them. You can't have cursing and blessing come out the same way. Well, yeah, I'm saved, yeah. When the rapture happens, there's going to be people sitting in churches saying, what happened? They're going to be asking their preachers, what happened? Hey, you know, millions of people disappear off the face of this earth. What happened? I mean, I thought you said, that's, I thought you said that was all just, you know, make-believe. And there's going to be a great falling away there's a falling away now. There's apostasy now from Christianity. But when the true church is removed, my goodness, they're all going to fall away. People that thought they knew the Lord, people that, that had made the commitment, people that said the prayer, people that went through all the motions that they told them they had to go through, that never, never really cared about what Jesus thought or nothing. They just wanted to get stuff done in their lives. They're going to be around saying, what happened? And they're all going to be caught away into the religion that's going to be promoted after, after that. Okay, listen to what he says. He says, That they shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed. Oh man, don't, don't, don't be trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. You know, don't, don't, I don't want to know who he is. I really don't. I don't want to be here when he's revealed. Amen. The Antichrist, the son of perdition, he's called the man of sin, the little horn, the lawless one, the beast, the willful king. There's all kinds of names. He's going to be Satan's Christ. 
Just like Jesus is the Son of God and empowered by God, this, this man will be empowered by none other than Satan himself. Before Christ can come back, there has to be this great falling away from the faith, from the true Christian faith, and it has to be the revelation of the man of sin. He says this man of sin, this son of perdition, verse 4, he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. This man, now see there has to be a temple. He's going to set himself up in the, in the temple in Jerusalem that they're going to build and he's going to call himself God. Now somebody might say, well that's silly. How can we think that people are gods? If you ever get a chance, I don't know, if you have, uh, on, on, our, on our, we have the, the dish, the satellite dish, and we get the documentary channel. Okay, I don't know if any of you get that or not. If not, you can go on, the, they have a website. And there's a program, program on there called Kim Jong Il, Ilya or something like that. And it has to do with people, they, they interview people that escaped from North Korea. Kim Jong-il is the leader of North Korea. And they talked to these people how they had to escape. And they said that when, when they were children brought up under this leader, they taught him that he was God. People in this nation believe that this man, this human being, was God. It's not beyond our imagination that, there, that human beings will be able to be deceived into believing that a human being is God. Because it goes on and it says... Verse 5, remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholds that he might be revealed in his time. Verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity does already work. Paul was saying, listen, it's the, 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 the evil, the underground undercurrent of evil in the world. It was working in Paul's day and it's working today. You know, you, you hear things like, you hear about the Illuminati and New World Order and all this other stuff. And whether that stuff is true, it might be, it might not be, I don't know. But I know this much. There's an undercurrent of evil that's driving forces on this planet. Economic forces, political forces, military forces. There's, there's an undercurrent. It's not God working. It's Satan working. And it's happening beneath the radar. It's happening underneath the scenes. The mystery of iniquity, Paul said. It was working in his day. It's been working for thousands of years. It's been working trying to diminish the effect of the gospel on the earth. It's been working trying to reverse everything that God wants to do. It's been working trying to set itself up, opposing everything that God is. And sad to say, we're letting it happen. It's working in government. It's working in the economy. It's working in church. It's working in church. There's an undercurrent of evil. Oh, especially in the church in the United States of America. I could get started on that and we'll be here till about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I won't. But it's working. People seeing angels, 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 angels. Where are them angels coming from? People getting, people getting revelations and all kinds of things and the manifestation. Where, where's it coming from? God can do anything. He can manifest himself in any other way. But I want to know what they're believing. I want to know what they're teaching. Because, he says, For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now lets, the King James it says, he who now lets, we could use the word restrain. For he who now restrains will restrain until he be taken out of the way. We believe that this is referring to the presence of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ. Do you know that we're re restraining evil? At least we ought to be. The presence of the body of Christ, the presence of the Holy Spirit working in the lives of believers is holding back Satan's hand. Some of you might say, we're not doing a very good job of it. Listen, when... When the, the church is taken out, we're not going to be able to imagine the evil that's going to be poured out on this planet. We won't even be able to fathom. He says, the mystery of iniquity does already work. 
Only he who now restrains will restrain until he be taken out of the way. Verse 8. And then, and then, see, I don't want to be here when he's revealed. <laughs> and then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, hallelujah, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. He's, God's going to, he's going to take care of him. Even him, verse 9, whose coming is after the working of who? Of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. He's going to do miracles. He's going to have power. He's going to be impressive. He's going to be able to bring peace to the Middle East. He's going to be able to do something about the economic problem. Matter of fact, you know what his, his uh, solution to the economy is going to be? No cash. A mark. Over in Revelation chapter 13. We call it the mark of the beast. He's going to cause everybody, instead of having cash in your pocket, everybody will, ha everybody will have an identification. You know, they have those RID, uh, uh, what do they call them, RICD chips, you know, individual. They're, they're putting, they put them in animals, so in case your animal runs away, you can find them. You can get them with a, you know, a GPS. Some people are even having them put in their kids. In case they get kidnapped, then you'll be able to GPS them. Well, hey, makes sense, right? Nobody can steal, I mean, if you have a credit card, people can steal it. That's going to be his, that's going to be the way he operates. Somebody says, you're making this up. Well, I might be making it up, but I think it's true. It's the way, that's what he says right here. He's going to control everything. He'll do signs, lying signs and wonders. Signs and lying wonders. Verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They don't want to hear the truth. It says, And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they might believe a lie. I want to tell you something. These people that continually hear the gospel and know what it says, and they say, no thank you. No, thank you. People that sit in church, people that play church, just like the people who were there in Jesus' day, the hypocrites, the scribes, and the Pharisees who were in charge of everything, and they rejected their Christ. People who sit in church and hear the truth Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, if, if they're hearing the truth at all, and reject the truth, and maybe they say, well, I don't like that church, so I'm going to go to some church that tells me everything is just going to be fine. And they'll, go, and they'll just reject the truth. The time will come when it will be impossible for them to believe the truth. That's... That's terrifying. There will be people saved in that day, but not the ones who sat up in church for 50 years and played and just pretended and said, yeah, oh yeah, okay. It says, because they received not the love. I want to ask you this morning, do you love the truth? I hope you love the truth. Truth hurts sometimes. I hope you love it. Because if you don't love it, you'll find something that you'll love. If you don't love the truth of the gospel, you'll go find something you love, and, it, and it'll, wear, it'll, it'll have a Christian sign on it. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure. God help us. In unrighteousness. But we, now here's the good news. If you're born again and saved this morning, here's the good news. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brother and beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, pretty heavy stuff about what's coming, but it's when we read about what we have right now, whether we live to see that day or not. Whether we live to see 
uh, you know, things are going to get a whole lot worse in this world before they get better. We might have to find ourselves going through some pretty tough times. Listen, it doesn't matter. If we belong to Him, then we belong to Him. Therefore, brethren, stand fast, in verse 15. Hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our letter. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which has loved us and has given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts. This is why when we partake of the Lord's table, we, we look forward to his coming. He wants us to be comforted. Even with stuff going on in Europe and America and stuff going on in Washington, D.C. And, and things, war going on in the Middle East and all this other stuff, we can be comforted knowing that God has it all planned out. It's all in his hand. If you're his, you don't have to be afraid. If you're his, you don't have to wring your hands. If you belong to him. He'll, listen, Jesus said, he told his disciples, he said, if the world hates you, don't feel bad. It hated me too. And he said, listen, I'm going away. You're reading John chapter 14, 15, 16. He says, I'm going away, but I'm going to send you another comforter. You see, whatever goes on in politics, in government, in society, in, in whatever, whatever is happening in this world, as ugly as it looks, oh, man, and if you watch the news program sometimes, you can get awful mad. There's enough stuff out there to just make you pull your hair out. I ain't got that much to pull out. I don't spend a lot of time with that stuff. Here's the good news. Here's the good news. Here's the good news. Here's what Jesus says. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He told us, he says, he'll be with us even unto the ends of the earth. He'll never leave us. He'll never leave us hopeless. He'll never leave us without a friend. He'll always be our friend. Whatever happens, I was thinking, just right now, there's a woman in Pakistan. They want to hang her. You know why? She's a Christian. There's a pastor in Iran who's been sentenced to death. You know why? He's a Christian. He was born a Muslim, but he became a Christian, and that's a death penalty. You see, we don't, we don't have a clue. We don't have a clue, but we might someday. Listen, I want to say this. We're going to partake of the Lord's table. And maybe you want to go ahead and get the kids up uh, so we can partake of the Lord's table. I want to ask you this. Very important. The most important question you'll ever, anybody will ever ask you and this question is going out to folks who have been here for a long time and folks maybe just here just brand new. It's for everybody, including the pastor. Do you know that you're saved this morning? I didn't ask you where you went to church. I didn't ask you how often you went to church. I didn't ask you, you know, are you good? Have you been good this last week? I didn't ask you that. I want to ask you before we partake of the Lord's table, do you know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Are you convinced that if that trump would sound today, you would be caught up to meet the Lord in the air? Are you convinced? Do you know that? So now I say, well, I hope so. And eh, Wrong answer. You need to know so. You need to know that through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven, and that the Father accepts you as his own. That he accepts you as his son. Do you know that this morning? The most important question you'll, you'll ever ask yourself. It's between you and God. It's not for me to know. Between you and him. If you're not sure, if you've never made Jesus your Lord and Savior. And see, listen, it's not about 
coming up and saying a prayer. We, we, we've, that's, that's our mode of evangelism in the United States of America. We'll get them to say the prayer. Hurry up and say the prayer quick. The prayer isn't about anything. It's about your heart. Is your heart right with God? Between you and God. No, you know, well, my mom, my dad, where I grew up. No. Between you and God, is your heart right with God? You need to ask yourself that before we partake of the Lord's table. Because here's what the Apostle Paul said. He said, if you partake of the Lord's table and you don't know what you're doing, you could, you could, you could eat or drink damnation to yourself. You could actually cause yourself to become sick or ill or even die. So you better know what you're doing. You better know what you're doing. Are you born again? Through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. I want to pray. And as we pray, if you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior. See, I, a lot of places have people come up and you know, raise their hand. I, I don't do it. This is between you and God. This is personal. Nobody, nobody can make you. Nobody can convince you. Nobody can do this for you. You have to do it for yourself. And your eternity depends upon it. I've said this. I hope and pray that nobody would ever walk out of this building not understanding what salvation is. Jesus Christ died on the cross and shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. Father, we come to you this morning. And I pray, Lord, that you would minister to the people in this room. There are people here who have known you and loved you for years and years and years. And there are some folks up here who maybe have only known you for just, just a short time. And there might be some folks in this room that have never, ever asked you to be their Lord and Savior. They have never, ever called upon you, put their faith and trust in the blood of Jesus. Father, I pray as we prepare to partake of your Lord's table that you would help us, Lord, each and every one of us, know beyond a doubt that our sins are forgiven and that we're new creatures in Christ because of our faith in you. I'd like to ask you all to stand if the young men will come.